Tractate Sanhedrin, page 9. Today we're going to speak about the different phases of religion when it's come to a law of defamation of character and its consequences, especially when it's a sensitive early part of relationship between the two. Um, the cases of um, reason to feel that way and the consequences or not. Also, we're going to speak about witnesses, especially in the cross-examination, false witnesses or double side witnesses, which we're going to talk later on. But um, because it's a broader subject, purposely yesterday we stopped on page 8b, so we study page 9, but we'll start on the top of page 8b. <coughs> a little background. Yesterday, we learn an important concept of a person who Motsi Shemra, who defame a character of his wife. Now, it's important for us, before we go further, I look at your faces, right? Um, we're not talking marriage in a modern day, by any means. We have to differentiate in an ancient time, in a Talmudic time, between Eurusim, the engagement, and Nisuin. In our days, soon you see, it's a total different story. In those days, engagement is marriage in a sense of our days, meaning she considering a married woman the moment they engaged. So if a man claimed that it was adultery on her part between the Eurusim and the Nisuim, the engagement, and the marriage, we need to have a very serious investigation because um, as we said, Eusin that time was, which we call nowadays Kiddushin. In our days, in that sense, um, the two parties get together, they some have letter of understanding if needed, they shake hands, they, 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 they drink something, but doesn't carry, doesn't resonate and carries the matter of Kiddushin that was that time. So obviously, biblically speaking, if it was something that examined and it turns to be true, that's a total different story. Chayevet mita, but if it's uh, obviously if you have a dim, etc. But uh, otherwise, it's just a matter of him, he wants the money of the ktuba. So, for those who are not familiar, the rabbis instituted a marriage contract which called ktuba at that Talmudic time, and we still use that phrase for that. Um, documentation, it's not a permissory note in that sense, but is a, a some type of basic contract understanding uh, between husband and wife, and the man basically commit himself to certain things. So, for example, for a virgin, at that time it was like 200 silvers, and uh, for a widow it was 100. It was totally different um, mindset. Now, the idea is if man comes after he got married and he said she wasn't virgin, etc., the question is how you treat it. No one should treat it lightly. I know that we are here in a Western culture, so we see things a little different. Uh, Middle Eastern, I can attest to you for all those years that I have the opportunity to be both in Lebanon and in Gaza, the um, enculturation, the mindset, the culture, they uh, take it in a very serious way. So the entire session today is going to be the disputation between two great scholars. One, his name is Rabbi Meir, and the other one is a group of scholars, we call it Chachamim, the sages. Rabbi Meir said that in order to have a court session for a defamer, meaning a man that claimed that she wasn't faithful to him, and you have to remember that it's all dependent also on the stages that when that happened. Um, is no need for more than a basic court of three rabbinic judges to convene and make ruling. The sages said, since there is a potential, soon you see, of violation of capital law that need to have a capital punishment, you need to have Sanhedrin Tana, which means small form of Supreme Court, which is 23. 
the deeper part of this discussion is what's the rational, what's the idea of Motsi Shemra? Why Rab Meir said three and the other one 23, the sages? So we're going to learn the concept of Motsi La'az, which means he ruined the reputation. He said something that basically knocked a potential opportunity from her. So the question is, is that a monetary compensation? Is that something to do with changing the structure of payment for that marriage contract? Or it's go to the next level, which is a totally different story of capital punishment. Let's start with the text first. Meitive. It's a brighter that speaks about um, the expenses of the Ktuba. Vachachamim omrim, the group of sages hold, the one who defamed the character Tva'o Mamon Bishlosha. If the person claim offer money, so therefore you need to have three rabbinic judges. Tva'o Nefashot, but if it's a potential for capital punishment, meaning the potential of getting to the structure of death penalty, that it's different story, it's 23. Bishlama le Rava, if you go by the view of the Rava, that what Rava tells us, that said that we are not concerned about Laaz. Laaz, as we said, that people will bad mouth. Um, it's only, which we call yesterday, Lichvodam Shel Rishonim, that we only concern uh, not about the um, um, rumors, but um, honor of the first judges. So if that's the case, Tva'om Amon Tchila. So the first stage of the husband come without bringing the witnesses. He just came by himself and he basically claimed for money. So as long as he's claiming for money, um, that's the way also the Torah Chaim and the Ran, Tosfot, others hold. But if it's, is his session start not with uh, witnesses and testimony, but only by himself, and the whole claim is in order to escape from the money part of the marriage contract, therefore, since it's a monetary law and a monetary discussion, Bishlosha, since it's the name of Monot, obviously you need three judges. However, Tva'o Nefashot Tchila, but if he initially claimed that she should be subject to that severe death penalty, so that's a total story. So, the four be'esrim ve'shlosha, it's uh, the honor of the first one. Ela uh, le'ula kashia. The ula is a problem. Why? Because the ula said that we care for the rumors. So, if the witnesses hear and they will come, so even if we claim over money, originally you uh, have to have, according to him, a session of 23 judges. So how come the Brita, this source said that if it was a claim, monetary claim, with solely three judges. So even he was kind of the other, present the other side, he, Rava himself said, together with Rav Chia Baravin, Amar Rava Ani, Va'ari Shebachavra, Ari, obviously it's uh, figuratively. He said, I and the great lion of the group, which is the, the, the great of uh, Chiyabar Abin, Targimna, we went ahead and we explained and interpreted the brighter that follow Ula's view, Umanu, who is the one who's considering quote unquote lion of the group. So he said, Rav Chiyabar Abin, Hacha b'may askinan. What exactly we're talking here in this brayta? Shehevi habaal edim shezinta. Here the husband brought witnesses to testify that the wife committed adultery. 
והביאה אב עדים והזימון לידי הבעל. So her father comes in and he brought another set of witnesses that basically um, contradicted. So in order to understand that, we need to refresh our memory for something we studied in Tractate Makot at the very beginning, the first daf. We have, in that sense, two sets of witnesses. Witnesses are always two. The first one, it's called a Dei Hakhasha. The second one is called Eidim Zomemim. A Dei Hakhasha, meaning you have Reuven and Shimon that come and file a claim, or, or come and testify. And they said, we saw her on a date and a time, and so and so. The other one came in and said, no, the story wasn't the way you describe it. The story was so and so and so and so. So here you have, in that sense, a cross-examination of two litigants that in our sense are equal in their um, credibility. It's called trei utrei. So we leave it as an unsolved pertigament because this quandary of to whom you choose is almost like choosing equal between the two sets versus if the last witnesses come in and said no how you give this this testimony if you Ruben and Shimon were with us at that time at the mall at the other side of the city you know at the side of the different location at that exact time you are with us over there so it means the, the, the rule is that you go, this is Gzerat HaKatuv, this is something we derive from the Torah, that you go by the last one, and therefore the first set of witnesses, it's already abrogated, and you treat it as a total false witnesses. So as we said here, we have Eidei HaKhasha, Eidei Hazama. Eidei HaKhasha, it's three and three, two and two, that just one said against the other, but holding about the structure of the story versus the second one that said how that can be that you bring a story while you are with us in different location. So here the father bringing the witnesses that said that um, the second one that you are with us in a different location at that time. So it means that the, the later one it turns that the witnesses that represent the hu husband was either paid witnesses, mercenaries, or people who basically not unscrupulous people that get paid in order to um, um, give a testimony and they are false witnesses. So therefore, we go and rule, Rashi explained, the same way as the Motsi Shemra, one who defamed the character, the Torah tells us in Deuteronomy 22, verses 13 to 19, that he needs to pay her father, remember this is the concept of her, her, that time, he needs to pay the father 100 slaim. Not just that, but he is also prohibited to marry, to divorce her for the rest of his life. So when we use the term tva'o mamon, that he claim over money, it, it is not that the husband go after the ktuba. It me means that this is speaks specifically about the hundred sela that the father claim go and ask from the husband, and it means va'o mamon bishlosha. The bright meant to say that it uh, applies to him um, going after him for um, payment with the court of three. So in that case, if the father we said, Ba ligvot mamon mi baal. So now, after the case was clear, and the father of the girl go after the husband, and he wants the compensation, which was at that time, follow the Torah law, 100 slain, bishlosha. Since this is only a monetary issue, we have to have three and obviously Tosfot and Binyan Shlomo and others say that all of that happened 
before it was a final verdict by any means. Um, and it's nothing to do with Anna or the early uh, court because um, it's total separate ruling. Ubimkom nefashot be'esrim be'shlosha. But if it's a capital punishment, for example, you have a full trial of the husband's witnesses that come in the court, so you have to have judge, uh, the, the judge reside among the 23 um, judges. And that way, uh, you understand the Tosefta with Ula's interpretations. So, typical consequences is a question that posted by the Maharsham, who's a one, not only a great Hasidic uh, rabbi, but big Torah scholars. So it was a fellow that was a akar, meaning he was childless. In those days it wasn't the same medical advances to recognize the problem, but he could not have children, at least for some period of time. Yes, a distant relative that stayed in his hotel, and all of a sudden his wife get pregnant. So he came to Marsham and he claimed that um, later on, um, they, um, when the baby was born, it looks like that man. So the Marsham, based on our sugya, said two important things. Number one, if she come and she said that she wasn't faithful, what we hold, if you remember, we studied in Ketubot, learn a minute less so. So when it's come to this, since she is screaming and yelling that she was faithful to him, so obviously is no reason to suspect anything, and therefore um, it's not an issue and you should let go, etc. Obviously, we are now in a different era. We have DNA, etc., so it's kind of easy to recognize. Abaye Amar de Kulei Alma, this is already the third avenue. Abaye said that according to both Rabbi Meir and the sages, remember Rabbi Meir hold you need to have a small court session of three, and the sages hold that you need to have 23. Chayshinan Lela as we are concerned for rumors. Umishum kvodam shel rishonim. And in addition to that, also the honor of the first judges. So, when it's come to this disputation between the Rabbi Meir and the sages, we said, even Rabbi Meir, he's only in a session hall that the husband comes here to do what? To collect funds and nothing else and he doesn't bring witnesses that need for that 23 judges in a court um, but the qu question is since witnesses will hear about it and the consequence will be maybe a case of capital punishment so in a sense even they start originally with 23 and later on it turns that this is a relatively simply monetary disputation that needs only the court of three judges instead of 23, you have to continue the session with the 23 because of honor of the early sages. Here, what exactly we're dealing with the witnesses to the adultery. They said, I try may hold that it's enough to have three judges reside. Kegon, if the husband brought witnesses at the very beginning of the court session. The atruba stam, stam it's important because uh, stam in, in this context it means that they didn't do any specific, they didn't go with the specification as to the extent manner of death penalty that she will receive. So in general we should know that the condition is a person, the, the Ran and others said that the person get punishment if the certain uh, precondition happened. Number one, if he did it intentionally. Number two, if they warn him in advance. So the whole idea of warning, later the Chidush said it has to be toch kedei dibu, during that time, not earlier, etc. So, so because of that, we hold that they, they if it's a regular without specification and the husband just brought the witnesses, um, coming so you don't um, 
you don't have the concern that another witnesses come and they change the verdict by any means. So, so I may hold if that's the case, you not worry about Dinene for short about capital punishment, and because of that, um, it's enough to have three judges. The high Tanahu and Rabbi Meir hold the same as Rabbi Yudah in the Brayta, the Tanya. We learn in regards to capital punishment, and this is basically um, Tosefta, but you see it in a few Gmarot, etc. Um, Masit is someone who convinces, like instigator, someone who convinces his fellow to go and worship idol. Um, so, again, the question is what exactly the, the evidence that w involved with this. But in general, all the other type of capital punishment, when it's come to express in their liability, you do it for the various death penalty that state in the Torah, that in the matter of, uh, for example, someone who idol worshipping, right, or um, someone who does um, any type of uh, violation that have structure of a uh, capital law. So obviously you have to have this uh, precondition. So he said, So he said, Ve'edim ve'atra, you need to have the 23 judges reside and witnesses that saw and they warn him not to do it. Ve'archiud yu shuchayab mita ve'bedin and until they said clearly that you're going to pay for that and by death penalty by the, the rabbinic court that um, um, after warning. Rabbi Yudha Omer, Rabbi Yudha disputed, and he says, no, it's capital punishment, Achud you bezem mitau nerag. The condition is that uh, you cannot execute it unless the witnesses had the uh, inform in advance that the defender, uh, that he is liable to receive the death penalty from the court. So Nigmar said, if that's the case, of Papa, oh, before of Papa, I want to elaborate a little bit from a book called Margalita Yam. So Margalita Yam brings a very important concept. We learn in the Torah the story of Mekashesh Etzim. Mekashesh Etzim, for those who are not so familiar, it was a fellow that gathered wood on Shabbat. And the way that the Torah described it was a witnesses that warned him not to do it. And then he basically, in Hebrew, said, Akar Mirashut Lerashut. He transferred those gathering woods from one location to another location. So here, what you see in this sugiya, Tanakama hold that it's enough to warn him that he is going to have a pa capital punishment. So that's sufficient to impose the verdict of punishment upon this litigant. Versus Rabbi Yudha said, in addition to that, you have to be very clear and, and lucid to say what in, for example, Arbat Mitot Beit Din, Skila, Srefa, Cherek, Vachenek, all these different type of capital punishment, which one you're going to be. So you have in addition to witnesses come in and in addition to the act of warning, they have also to spell out what exactly the capital punishment he is going to uh, get. So how the Torah describe it? The Torah said that they put him in kind of temporarily detention in a jail until the Almighty will tell them after Shabbat what type of punishment he gets. So, and then, the, what did the Torah say? We all know, I assume, that he gets the capital punishment. So, the Machzita Shekel, um, Machzita Shekel's son, he, uh, he brings, on behalf of a great Torah scholar, scholar, Rab Wolf, so he basically said, when you have um, 
the concept of Torah Mishamayim. So we said, when it's come to monetary payment, remember the story of Tanuro Shalachachinai, Torah is not Mishamayim, you go by the way Rabbi Yeshua Hold and others, that um, it's by the eye of the judges, the way the judges judge, that's the way you rule. So Kal Bachomer, how much so? If you tell me that when it's come to a monetary disputation, monetary rules, that the court needs to go not by any heavenly sign, by the reality of the way that they perceptualize the the um, the all consequential evidence and the way that they make their own decision. How much so when it's come to a dinain of a short, when it's a capital punishment? So it's not by the um, the way that he tried to say is in a time of Moshe Rabbeinu, in a time of Moses, that there is a high level of poverty. So obviously um, it's different, but when is Moses was no longer among the living. And there's no human that know the whole Torah in everything. So that's a different story because here in the Mekoshesh, Obviously, Moshe Rabbeinu knew. The only question is, sometimes a person in that sense will say, look, if you tell him to get chenek, um, that forbid he's not strangulation, he's not care about skila. No, that's something he's not wished to have. So here, according to this view, uh, Moshe Rabbeinu already knew that it makes no difference for the Mekoshesh what type of punishment he is going to get. So according to Rabbi Yuda, Mekoshesh, Aya over Alisur, he will be in a state of violation regardless. So therefore, that's the reason, according to that view of Rav Wolf and, uh, and others, uh, that he received the capital punishment. You can see more on that in the book called Margalit Hayam. Of Papa Amar. Of Papa tell us, and that's actually the fourth avenue. And the, according to Rav Papa, he says that everyone concerned about rumors. Years back, I remember that people said that rumors, rumors, people talking. In those years, they used to call it in the army, Seren Shmuati, meaning there is someone who's spreading rumors. And as you know, when it's come to rumors, people have all kind of crazy interpretations. It can go either way, but um, basically, um, we concern about rumors. We concern about the respect, the honor of the previous court sessions, and that's basically follow the view of Abaye, um, um, Tosfot, Rashi uh, said that. Uh, uh, yes, the husband brought the witnesses that it was an act of adultery but something was not right with the whole court session. Either it was chisaron Batra'a, the way that they warn, or uh, others. So the disputation between Rabbi Meir and the sages Tosfot said is for that deficiency, that missing part in the testimony. So um, according to Rabbi Meir, that's not caused a capital punishment in any form when it's even small deficiency. And he's not considering a dutne for short, he's not under that category. So, therefore, you have um, it's sufficient to have a court of three judges versus the sages say that um, it's enough. And that small thing, it's not make a big difference in a court. Anyway, so here, Vehacha Beisha Havera Askina. So, in those days, the way that the Rambam in Perusha Mishnayot on Tractate Dmai, Chapter 2, Mishnah 3, explains that Haver in general, we call a Talmid Chacham, a Torah scholar, that he is also not only erudite, but he is part of the team, meaning he is knowledgeable, etc., etc. But um, um, the whole kind of friendship is the Lashem Shamayim for the sake of heaven. It turns here that it speaks about female meaning a woman that she is Torah scholar, she is um, erudite in this um, law of the Torah. If you read the books like the Daughters of Rashi, um, one of them, Rabbi Bell Wine, have a beautiful um, taking from this, that it is not only Bruria in the Talmud, but there are women that have this level of caliber in the Torah knowledge, Askinan. 
וכמפלגי בפלוגתא דרבי יוסי בר יהודה ורבנן. So the Rambam, as we said, tells us that what is a real friend, a real chaver. So he said that it's when he's a trustworthy for the Shem Shamaim, he does everything for the sake of heaven. So Talmud Chacham, in several places in the Talmud, is called chaver. So here the disputation between Rabbi Meir and the sages is the disputation between Rabbi Yuda, Rabbi Yossi and Rabbi Yuda and the sages, and the following brighter, the Tanya. Rabbi Yossi bar Rabbi Yudah Omer Chaver, as we said, Chaver is the Torah scholar. So he said, Ein tzarich hatra'a. So it means that they, uh, someone who is such a knowledgeable in Torah does not need to be issued a forewarning by witnesses. Why? So, Lefi shelo nitna hatra'a, Hela leavchin ben shogeg lemezid. The whole purpose of us forewarning someone is given to distinguish between unintentional sin and intentional sin. And in the case of a chaver, this is again someone who's Torah scholar, it's clear that he is aware of the halachot. So here you see the rabbis, they hold that even a chaver may be punished unless he has been forewarned. So Rav Papa suggests that may hold that in the a chaveira, meaning female Torah scholar, she must be forewarned. And the Mishnah discusses a case when the forewarning did not take place. And consequently, what you see here that the trial of all of her alleged defamer could not deal to capital punishment. There is a book called Yad Ramah, and the Yad Ramah explains that if you take, for example, the law of Shabbat. So Talmid Chacham, Torah scholar, in a way, he doesn't need to have the forewarning. Why? Because he is um, Baki, he is erudite in Ilchot Shabbat. But you need to clarify because sometimes he may, for all kinds of reasons, forget that today is Shabbat. Or he knows the law of Kashrut. But sometimes you need to refresh his memory. You know, this type of food have issue with so and so and so and so. So because it may happen innocently that that Torah scholar just forget about it. My brother-in-law, Rav David Avraham Mandelbaum from Bnei Brak, is a huge Torah scholar. Uh, he published a book by a fellow that perished in the Shoah, Chelkat Yoav. So in the Chelkat Yoav he brought that in those days it was the crazy rule of the kingdom. And the kingdom in those years, I assume in my best recollection, was in, in, in Poland, that each and every time you have a chupa, you have to have, in a way, government appointee of uh, witnesses. So if you remember, we discussed the other day of Wadi Yosef, when they want to put even among the regular court, two regular Torah scholar pious judges, one from the government, and uh, Rav Yosef opposed it. Here the Chalkat you have discussed, how do you treat it? Because you sent two soldiers to be witnesses in that chupa at that time. So the question is, if the rumors that they are, for example, not uh, Shabbat observance, which basically disqualify them from being witnesses. So you mean to say that that's... Um, this validates the whole marriage um, uh, contract and, and they need to start from scratch or not. So he said, he explained beautifully and he said, look, the Chalkat Yoav, said, if you talk about Torah scholar and a pious man, God-fearing man, so obviously regardless if he's a um, Torah scholar or not, as long as he's a pious person, have Chizka, you have Chizkat Kashrut, you have this and presumption that he is a trustworthy, for example, when it's come to Kashrut, Shabbat, etc., it may happen that that person just forget that this is a problem or this is prohibited, etc. But these soldiers do not carry which call Chazkat Kashrut by any means, so there's no need to forewarn them, you don't need to say anything. So, therefore, um, the whole concept of that. Um, 
testimony is now relevant if it turns that they are in Shabbat violations. Anyway, the fifth explanation, it's totally different and is dealing with the law of Malkot, which is soon you see the lashes, and the explanation of this Mishnah go by Rav Ashi. So Rav Ashi said, Rav Ashi Amal, Kegon, here the dispute in the Mishnah involved with what? Page 9, the Atru Ba, Masorot Ashar said, Atru Ba Malkot, Velo Atru Ba Ktala. So it's a total different story. They warn her, uh, in a sense, the witnesses warn her that she should be liable to receive Malkot, but they not talk, they not warn her over death penalty. So we have to understand the Gemara in Tractate Makot, page 13b, explained to us we have two different concepts in the Torah. One is the Lotin Af, one of the Ten Commandments that involve with married women, they committed adultery. There is another concept, it's called Azharat Beit Din, which is, Rashi explained, that it's different, that the, the, the court will try her um, for adultery and is found guilty, she will receive Malkot, but not the, the penalty. So as you see, the Kamifligei Biflugta Rabbi Ishmael Verabanan. So basically, in that sense, since the whole forewarning by the witnesses was only talking to her about Malkot, so here you juxtapose the disputation between Rabbi Meir and the sages in um, equivalent in that sense to the disputation between Rabbi Ishmael and the sages within our Mishnah. So now we go back to the original Mishnah in this tractate which was on the very beginning, on page 2, and the Mishnah said Makot, when it's come to receive the 40 lashes. So they said, this type Malkot Arba'im, you need to have Bishlosha, you need to have a court session of three judges. Mishum Rabbi Ishmael Amru Be'esrim Veshlosha. So, God willing, the next daf on page 10, we explain the reasoning for Rabbi Ishmael and the sages. But on his behalf, behalf for our, our understanding, they said on his behalf that they, 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 um, the cases that involve with this type of lashes or malkot, they have to have a court session of 23. So what you see here, a may hold when you have a case of defam defamer, one who's come and defame the character. So in that sense, it may be, have to have only three rabbinic judges because he hold that the court of three can administer this type of lashes, the Malkot. But the, the other opinion that hold that the Malkot um, needs to have the court of 23, hold that this case um, have also 23. So that's the reason why they requested to uh, this uh, form of 23 um, judges. Yad Rama said, it's a beautiful touch here, he said, when it's come to uh, an Ishabe Malkot, when it's come to a punishment that involved with lashes at that time, it's in a way substitute, bin komita. And therefore, the Gemara treated as it is the name of Ashot. I remember this go back maybe 40 some years ago. So it was in the Erev Yom Kippur in the ultra Hasidic sect. They used to go and um, I don't know how exactly they said it uh, here, but it's like a, some type of Malkot before Yom Kippur and people did it as an act of um, preparation for Yom Kippur. Obviously, if you remember when we study Rambam, uh, in Judaism, we'd not encourage any form of uh, flag legation or self flag legations, but it's important to know that the way Radrama said that because it treated the Malkot as a, as a in a way, a substitute for Nefashot, that's the reason why we treated um, in that way. Now we go to the sixth explanation, and the sixth explanation is the Ravina. 
רבינה אמר, כגון שנמצא אחד מן העדים, קרוב או פסול. Here we're dealing with a case that when we dip in our investigation, we unfortunately discover that one of the witnesses is either a close kin, a close relative, or the uh, close relative meaning to that woman that have this testimony, or another option that he has some other um, disqualification and therefore, <coughs> as uh, we're going to study on page 27b, that anyone who has some type of um, connection in a sense that he will not be truthful, um, we uh, disqualify that person from taking um, par partake of the testimony. So, since it was there, for example, four or even three witnesses, so therefore you can have the affirmation of that testimony even without one problematic ad, ad witness. The Kamifli Gay, so Abimeo, and the sages have in a way juxtaposition to the disputation Biflugta de Rabbi Yossi ve Rabbi Aliba de Rabbi Akiva. Ditnan, that's a Mishnah in tractate Makot, page 5 and 6. Based on the Torah view, on the book of Dvarim, Deuteronomy, chapter 19, verse 15, the Torah said, Al pi medim, by the witnesses of two, or shlosha, or three, yakum davar, everything will stand for. So it means, why you need to say, if you have two, or al pi shlosha, or by the three. If you tell me that the two witnesses are deemed credible, that should be sufficient. You don't need to add that even three, three it's obvious. Rabbi Akiva Omer lo bashlishi ela lechamir alav. So Rabbi Yossi said, you know what, that, that, that's the reason we, we added. The, the Rabbi Akiva said, you hold that you bring the third witness only to be stringent with him, to make his status like these other two witnesses. La sodino kayotze be'elu. So you have this team of three witnesses, and it turns to be a lying, conspiring, conspiring witnesses. So the third one must claim that his testimony was unnecessary, and therefore he did not do any harm. So the Torah, nevertheless, imposes upon him the same strict punishment as the other two in the peer. That's the concept of ve'asitem lo. You should punish him ka'asher zamam, the way that he intent to harm the other one. Even he can come and say, yeah, we, even without me, the court will rule the way the court ruled. But since you are part of the conspiracy, since you are joined the other two, so you are responsible the same as the other two. So if they intend to put someone to death, and it turned to you, you cannot escape from that. By the way, just a side note. One of the Kitvei Ha'arizal, the great Kabbalist rabbi of the 16th century, it's the um, book in Vav Shara Gilgulim, uh, student Rabbi Chaim Vital in, uh, composed from the Ariza writings, um, beautiful gates of uh, transmigration in Judaism. So in very short, he's a special chapter, it's a chapter 36, over there that deal with who, what, meaning those souls that came back, that transmigrate, was basically as a tikkun, as a repair, and he goes at length to even give a name and who's coming from whom, etc., which is in a way kind of frightening. We're getting close to the days of ours, the high holidays, and uh, part of the statement we make is who should live, who should die, and how people will judge. That's something that people should take to heart. But anyway, in Ken Anasha Katuv Etanitpal Leovrei Avera, that's so deep and beautiful, the, the rabbi's mindset. Because Rabbi Akiva elaborates and he said, this halacha implies also in addition, the Torah punishes the one who acts as an, a part of the, this 
uh, transgressors, people who violate the law, the same punishment is the primary one. Even he was in a way secondary, but since he was one of them, we give him the same punishment. And he said, Alachat kama vechama, oh, the more so the other way around. She shalem sacharet anitpal leose mitzvah keose mitzvah. So the idea is that how much so the Almighty will pay to those who intend or been part of good deed of mitzvah the same way as people who really actually did the mitzvah. Because we learn, as Rashi tells us, midat tova gdola mi midat pu'anut, which means Rashi explained on the tracted Makot, uh, page 5, and also in Yumai 76, based on the Pasuk in Shmo 34, when it was the whole big to-do of the golden calf, and said that God punished the Avot uh, al the, the second generation, etc. It's all depend upon, um, you can go around and say that rewards can perpetuate. Umash naim nimtza echad men karovo pasul edutan psula, if two, one of them turned to be a relative, or some disqualifications, his testimony is no longer valid because it's only one witness left that he is valid. And as we explained many times, based on our Torah, one witness, Ed Echad and Oneman, one witness is not qualified. Af Shlosha, the same applies when you have uh, three witnesses. Nimtza Echad Mem Karovo Pasul. If it turns that one of them is either a relative or someone who's disqualified, a dutan bete la. Their matter of witnesses is no longer an um, uh, effective one. Why is that? Uminain shafilu mea. Even you have one wit 100 witnesses, one of them turned to be disqualified, so everything fall apart. Talmud Lomar Eidim but the Torah used the term Eidim, witnesses, that even hundred the same rule. So the Khatam Sofer he um, dealt with the case that it was Sidu Kiddushin, it was a rabbi that officiated a wedding and he basically um, took witnesses that later on turned to be a um, relative. I think they are relatives, they are obviously, as we said, they are disqualified. That's the whole idea of miyachadim shneedim laedut, that you go among the entire crowd and you allocate um, two witnesses that they are specifically, his need, the groom need to say, atem die, you are my witnesses. So they ask the Khtam Sofer, it means since it turned to be Relatives, is that mean that the whole Maasek Kiddushin, the whole matter of marriage is not valid? As you remember, we studied in Kiddushin 6 that whoever, whoever is not familiar should not involve with it. So the Khatam Sofer explained ingeniously, beautifully, and he said, if it was a place of Haggadat Edut, Haggadat Edut means you have these witnesses that comes in and they basically give us a testimony. So therefore, if they are relatives, they make it pasul, they make it invalid, and it's over. Versus when it's come to chupa vekidushin, when it's a matter of a regular case of bride and groom under the wedding canopy, the whole idea of witnesses is in order to promulgate she yet called the promulgate that she is a married woman, so it's a total different requirement, mindset, etc. And this deep, sophisticated thought also hold by both Rabbi Akiva Eger and Noda Bihuda, the great Rabbi Landau of Prague. They are both in the book dealt with the case of deserted wife, which is aguna, meaning the husband disappear and we don't know what's the situation. So she brought before the rabbini court in both cases, Rabbi Akiva Igor and Noda Biuda. And 
her witnesses, one turned to be not mehman, not credible. So he said, if it's not Haggadat Edut, we are more lenient, especially when it's come to Aguna. And that's the mindset of the Rabbi Akiva Iger, no Yuda, and Khatam Sofer. So again, we here differentiate between two different Haggadat Edut, between people who are come in the court to give a testimony over events, versus you selected two people that confirm the promulgation of making women from a single to be married. So it's a totally different mindset. So therefore, if there are circumstances that one of them turn to be invalid, according to this notion of Khatam Sofer, you can go lenient. But again, if in any case like that, a person should ask a prominent posek, prominent rabbi, and should not rule based on our learning today. Our job is we call in rabbinic horror, just to wake up our heart and mind to the concept. Amar Rabbi Yosei. So now we have the Tanaim discuss the Rabbi Kiva's opinion, and Rabbi Yosei hold. Amar Rabbi Yosei b'med varim amurim. When is that situation that we said that the testimony is nullified? Bedinei nefashot. Why, when it's come to a execution, capital punishment, we try to be lenient and find a merit in order to abrogate, to expand this type of, of witnesses, because the Torah said in the book of Bamidbar, chapter 35, the congregation should rescue, should save. So it means the bad din should go out of the way to save. But when it's come to a monetary disputation, so even if one of the witnesses turned to be a relative or disqualified, the rest of the witnesses can have their testimony. Rabbi Omer, Rabbi disputed Rabbi Yossi, and he said, Echad dinei mamonot, ve'echad dinei nefashot. He said, Regardless, in both cases of monetary law and the cases of capital law, he said, if one of the witnesses was a relative by any mean or other absolute or other invalidity, this validity, so that everything is falling apart. The matai, when you hold this, bizman shehi trubaim, mean when the relatives or disqualified witnesses also warned the transgressor and therefore you see here that they are actively included themselves in the group of witnesses. Aval bizman bahem. So the Ritva on Makot, page 6, you see it in the Rashi here also, he said, when it happened that they did not warn the transgressor. So if they not warn it, so it's all at Bishat yeah, the time that, that the, 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 it happens, that the Rashbam and the Tosfot hold the same thing. Because here we clearly differentiate between Mammon and Efashot, between monetary payment and capital punishment. Because the Meiri explain, they, they, they ask them, do you intend hit kavnula idolo, what is exactly intent to do versus Nefashot? that you must have this forewarning. So basically we can, we can attest if it was in their intent. I would like to share with you the uh, important Rambam. The Rambam tells us in Ilchot Edut, chapter 5, I'm reading from Rav Steinzos, the Koran edition, May Hashem give him a refuah Ma. If one among the large group of witnesses is found to be a close relative or a disqualified witness, the entire testimony is not valid. This is the halakha only if all the witnesses intended to testify. If not, the testimony may be upheld on the strength of the valid witnesses. How is this determined? The court must ask the witnesses if they um, uh, witness the event with the intention to testify about it, and therefore, if so, the testimony is not valid. Nevertheless, some say that the testimony is not valid only if the disqualified 
witnesses in question actually come to the court in order to testify. And there, having seen the events with the intent to testify, it is not enough to include them in the party of witnesses. So these uh, principles apply whether it, if, uh, it is a case of capital law or of a monetary law, as the halakha follow the ruling of Rabbi Udanasi. The Choshen Mishpat, the Shulchan Aruch Code, Choshen Mishpat uh, 36, said if one of many signatories to, the, to a contract is a close relative or pasul leidut or disqualified witness, if it is clear that they all sign with the intent to function as witnesses, the contract is nullified. If not, it may be upheld on the strength of the valid witness. So, um, was one book that I would like to mention to you. It's a beautiful writing, Rabbi Uven Mar Galiot. Based on this Gemara, I asked the question, in many um, shuls, in many places, when they want to do something uh, to uplift the soul of the deceased, they divided the Shas, they divided the Talmud among people. So, Mr. Or, or Rabbi or so-and-so will do Masechet Brachot, this one will do Masechet Shabbat, this will do Eruvin, Psachim, Rosh Hashanah, Yoma, Sukkah. They just divided the entire Shas to a group of people. Each of them have his own Masechet, his own tractate. So you ask a question, it turns that some of them did not complete the Shas, and you call it Siyum Shas. So you explain based on our previous Sugiya that we talk about uh, accessors, Nitpalim, that they have become part of that, he says the same here, based on our sagia, shenit palim beyachad shas, which means that the completion is considering as um, total one entity. So page 9b, maya asu shne achim veechad, sherau beechad sherag et anefesh. If that's the case, how you treated the situation, you have two brothers, and one other person, meaning not a brother, so we have three, if they saw someone kill another person. So what you have here? There are two brothers. So if there are two brothers, if they are, in the fact, saw the event together, that's basically invalidate the testimony. There are two brothers. Then no one can ever be tried to be a transgressor, committed in the presence of relatives. Because you see what happened, they are relatives. Uh, they, we're going to study it both on page 28, and you see it also in the Choshen Mishpat in the Code 33. So, um, you basically said, since one of the brothers is Karov, is blood relative, therefore the whole Eidut Betela, the whole manner of testimony, expunge, we can abrogate it. So, how, what can you do in a case like that. So it means, as in, if one of the brothers did not forewarn that person, meaning that individual, and the other brother did not intend to be part of the testimony, so therefore is not considering an aid. So it means if one may decide whether or not that he will be a witness, one of the brothers may join the third person in warning the potential transgressor, and therefore constitute a pair of valid, of Shnei Edin Kshirim, of valid witnesses. Similarly, the Mishnah is um, understood the, 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 that the, the uh, betrothed woman committed adultery, and of the three witnesses, two were brothers. So now you see the complication. If one of the brothers refrained from warning her, the remaining two witnesses may still testify against her. That's basically the, the view of Rabbi Udana C. So in this type of situation, the case must be tried by capital, you know, by the Sanhedrin Ktana, which is the 23 judges. So according to Rabbi Yossi, the case may be tried to, uh, by three judges, and that's the 
crucial the whole disputation here 23 versus 3 but the idea of the 3 is because when, when it's come to a capital law the two brothers invalidate the testimony merely by seeing the event together by merely fact that they are brothers that's the way the Meiri explained to us in tractate Makot page 6 now we're going to the seventh explanation remember the whole whole session today involved with that disputation of Rabbi Meir and the sages 3 verses 23 monetary capital okay the Iba it Eima another scenario Kigon when the witnesses come and said Shehitruba Achirim Velo Itruba Edi which means others come and warn her but the, these witnesses themselves did not warn her so here again, it's a disputation. Ubi plugta the kapi flagei bi plugta the Rabbi Yosef Rabbanan. Why? Because based on what we study in Tractate Makot, page six b, ditnan Rabbi Yosei Omer leolam enon heragad shiu pi shnei yadav matrimbo. When we impose capital punishment, is only a person can never execute it unless the mouth of the two witnesses are those who warn him. Because the Torah said, Al pi shnaim edim, at the mouth, pi, at the mouth of two witnesses. So the pasuk have strong emphasis on the mouth of, that the witnesses must issue warning themselves. So in that sense, Rabbi Meir agree with Rabbi Yossi that the woman cannot be executed if others gave her warning. So what you see that the whole trial of the defamer needs only three judges, and the rabbis and Mishnah agree that the, the, that, that statement in Makot, that basically said that, um, uh, that disagree with Rabbi Yossi. So since uh, she may be tried uh, for adultery, the case required 23. So that's, again, that's the point of the disputation. The Iba Itema, and I will go to the last one, which is the eighth explanation. And just as a side note, you shall know that they said that in those days, Bet Din that imposed capital punishment once in a 70, 70 years, consider a cruel, um, unbelievable Bet Din, which you show here during the course that there are so many obstacles um, to make uh, execution of individual that it's close to impossible. The Iba Itema, you can may say, it's a different explanation, Kegon de Itkachush Bebdikot, Velo Itkachush Bachakirot. So here, we seen we have two different stages. One, we have a examination, and the other one, we have interrogation. So you see, for example, in the whole process of examination, contradictions. And the moment you see contradictions uh, involved with the specific details of the incidents, incidents, the judges have an eyebrow, they, they start asking questions, what's going on? But then, when it's come to an interrogation itself, uh, there is no, any, there's no contradiction, everything is clear, which is the place of the incidents, which is the primary substance of the testimony. So therefore, when you have this type of situation, one fellow said that the, 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 the clothing was black, the other one said the clothing was white, right? So in this type of situation, you are basically, go on one hand and you say that you have the mitzvah to, to investigate it, but the kamif plegei beplugta, the ben aza, the ben zakai verabanan. So they go here by the disputation, Rab Meir and the sages, in conjunction to the disputation between Rabbi Yochan ben Zakkai and the sages, Ditnan. This is something we're going to study on page 40. On page 40 is a story, Umase Ubadak ben Zakkai, some said Rabbi Yochan ben Zakkai, is a different version, Be'uktsei Te'enim, that he basically uh, check the stems of figs as to their color and shape, in order to expose a contradiction between the witnesses. So when he found a discrepancy uh, in the reports about the figs, he dismissed this testimony. So may adopt the opinion that therefore the woman cannot be tried for adultery if the witnesses disagree with the, about the details like this. 
and the sages accept that, uh, such testimony and consequently they require a court of 23 uh, judges. But in general, they, um, they, uh, we have here eight different avenues to understand the disputation between Rabbi Meir and the sages. As we said, Rabbi Meir required three, the sages required 23. We have Ula, we have Rava, we have Abaye, we have Rav Papa, we have Rav Ashi, we have Ravina, we have the other Ravina, and we have the third Ravina. So all together we have eight different avenues, and obviously we don't have the time to elaborate more, but the core is this disputation between Rav Meir and the sages. Um, it's a, a different ways to understand what exactly Rav Meir and the sages disputed. Mm -hmm.